Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show for May 22nd, 2016. Before we get started into the news, I'd like to say that I've seen The Nice Guys. I have seen it. The reason a review isn't up for it at the moment is because when you have two jobs, you can get tired and sometimes it can distract from doing this because you're just exhausted. You want to lie down. You want to sleep. But I have seen it. I will have a review up for it tomorrow. And another thing that's kept me from doing this review are those angry birds. I did not see the movie. I did not see the movie. But the, what the movie has done is it got me addicted to that game again. <laughs> I redownloaded the Angry Birds app on my phone and the last time I played Angry Birds was when I was at Santa Monica College because I would arrive to my class, I would arrive to the school three hours before the class started. And I know some of you are wondering, why the hell would you even consider that? The reason is because if you've ever been to Santa Monica College, if you're a student there, hopefully you know that parking there is awful. You have to get there super super early just to get a spot so i would do that and i would be there three hours before my class and the only thing to do is waste time on angry birds so advice kids if you don't want your time wasted or if you're bad at putting away a video game or just doing like one more thing for a video game until it gets to you've done a million things don't download the angry birds app because it is really one to take your time away <laughs> but uh enough of that let's get into the news and we have a couple things here worth mentioning um if you hear any squeaks in the background i apologize um i'm sitting in a chair that's very squeaky so there's nothing i could do about that except try and find a new chair anyway we have a couple stories here from the world of superhero movies we have uh, some stuff involving a galaxy far, far away. We have a couple trailers to talk about, one of which the internet's talked about non-stop, and I'm sick of hearing about it, but it's kind of too big to not talk about it. And a certain giant lizard has a movie that's finally coming to the U.S. on DVD officially. But first, let's get into DC, DC Comics, because there's some big... Big, 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 big news going on over at DC. They have finally found their Kevin Feige equivalent, which it's about time. This story comes from Deadline, and it says, quote, Deadline has confirmed a major reorganization at Warner Brothers regarding the approach to the still-building film series based on its DC Comics properties. Warner Brothers declined comment, but sources with knowledge of the reorganization have confirmed that DC Chief Content Officer Jeff Johns who helped establish the brand's presence on television with stuff like Arrow, The Flash, uh, and Supergirl, and Warner Brothers Executive Vice President John Berg will now co-run DC Films. While DC Films has long been a production banner within Warner Brothers, it will now exist as a formal division as the studio seeks a course correction after the mixed response to Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice earlier this year. This is fantastic news for me. Um, well, I mean, there's a... There's one thing that concerns me, but first let me say why this is awesome. Because with Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, nobody was steering the ship. You had a director on board who really did not like Superman at all. I mean, you could really see it, especially in Batman vs. Superman. Zack Snyder does not seem to care for the character of Superman, which, even though he might not be the most interesting superhero out there, he is the most iconic superhero out there because super is in his name he's the definition of like a standard superhero he flies he's super strong he shoots lasers from his eyes you can't go wrong with superman and Zack snyder apparently did not give a shit about the character so with jeff johns and john berg on board they I think will be running things. Hope and Jeff Johns even said that that brooding Superman that you saw in Batman vs Superman: Man of Steel will not be coming back. Like when Superman comes back, 
he'll be the Superman that we all remember and love. One of the reasons I hate Batman vs. Superman even more, outside the fact that it completely disrespects Superman, and there's a lot of shitty story elements, is that there are two things that I really like about the movie. I really like Ben Affleck as Batman. Even though Batman just flat out murders people, um, Ben Affleck is still really good Batman, and he is the best looking Batman we've gotten. Although, I have to say, as the months have gone by, I went back to Michael Keaton being my favorite Batman. And then I also really like Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman. I mean, we'll ultimately see how she does in the Wonder Woman solo movie next year, but I really liked her as Wonder Woman. Everything else around it was dog shit. Huh? So, to ha- and nope, and nobody was in control. Nobody could put Zack Snyder on a leash and say, no, you can't do that, huh? which is a perfect segue into what concerns me about this story. And th- from Deadline, it says, quote, However, while the Warner Brothers move is a major step for the studio, it is, we're hearing, not a reactionary one. DC Films is not being created as a clone of Marvel Studios, nor does Warner Brothers intend to copy the Marvel method of making films, which is to say, Johnsonberg won't be occupying a role similar to Kevin Feige at Marvel. We've been told that the so-called director-driven, and that was in closed quotes, by the way, approach Warner Brothers has touted since first announcing the DCEU is very much still in effect. Johns and Berg, who will still report to their respective superiors within Warner Brothers as they attend to their other duties, will be providing guidance and structure to the task of building out the DCEU. Individual directors will therefore retain control over key decisions, including casting, aesthetics, and certain story elements. Okay, this whole thing of, like, oh, we're director-driven studio, we're not gonna put control over uh, what a director has, if it's something that has a brand name on it, you can't let the directors just go do whatever they want, huh? because you have to make thing- have things make sense. The reason you hear Marvel being so controlling is because they want things to make sense when the films connect to each other, like when you bring Ant-Man into Captain America, like it has to feel the same. It has to feel like they exist in this universe. And the whole like Marvel being creative freaks over every movie they make is total bullshit. There are points, if you watch a good chunk of the Marvel movies, mainly the best ones, You see that the directors do have control over certain elements. For example, Joss Whedon's Avengers, the first Avengers mainly, has a lot of Joss Whedon's uh, trademark humor. And Joss Whedon was actually one of the reasons why people say the Marvel Universe is more comedic and lighthearted. And then if you watch Captain America the Winter Soldier... You notice that Danny Pudi from Community makes a cameo, and in Captain America Civil War, Jim Rash from Community makes a cameo, huh? and the Russo brothers have both been a big part of Community. They directed a handful of episodes, huh? so you can't tell me that the idea to put two Community alumni in their Captain America movies was Marvel's decision, and then if you look at Guardians of the Galaxy, the decision for the soundtrack I guarantee you it was James Gunn's doing, as well as putting Nathan Fillion in a cameo role and hiring uh, Michael Rooker as Yondu, who starred in Slither that uh, James Gunn directed. And to say that this decision's not a reactionary one, it is, because DC, really, as much as I'm rooting for them, I still want them to make really good movies that can be as good as Marvel's. They are trying their damnness to catch up with Marvel, and they're doing it too quickly to the point where they don't earn anything. So, I don't know. This is really good news that they finally have two people who will oversee everything, and hopefully, uh, by Justice League, we'll see if this decision pays off. Because with Suicide Squad, it's too late. Suicide Squad's done. It's going to come out in a few months. And as for Wonder Woman... The only thing they could possibly offer are during reshoots or during post because Wonder Woman's done filming. So whatever they filmed is what we're stuck with. So hopefully it's good. (laughs) But, um, you know, before we move on to the next thing, there was a story. I didn't have this on my list of stories to talk about. But there was a story that um, reporting early reactions to 
Suicide Squad that they were... Okay, this comes from movieweb.com. I'm not going to read the reactions, but you can go check it out. But I will read that the headline says, Suicide Squad early reactions call it perfect and breathtaking. Uh, which I've heard that before. When Man of Steel came out, I've heard reports saying that it was the best superhero movie of the year. And then I saw it and I was like, okay, this is not good at all. And to be fair, to be perfectly fair, that same year, there were reports that Iron Man 3 was better than The Avengers. And I saw it, I'm like, yeah, this is not better than The Avengers. Not even close. And then just this year with Batman vs. Superman, there were reports saying that it's the best DC film ever made. That everything about it is really good. Like people were giving it really glowing reviews. And then I saw the movie and I'm like, the fuck are they talking about? This is awful. And again, to be fair again, uh, to go into the other side, even though what I'm about to mention is Fox. People were saying the same thing about last year's Fantastic Four, that it was a borderline masterpiece or something. And I saw it, and, and every, we all saw it, and it was atrocious. I don't think there's one person on the world who could say that Fantastic Four from 2015 is a good movie by any stretch of the imagination. So I tend to not really trust these things at all, especially since this is the third DC Extended Universe film, and this is the third time we've heard, oh, reactions are good, and then we see the movie, and it's like, oh, somebody was lying. So, I'm, you know what, I'm just going to wait until the movie comes out, and we'll see what happens. So, that does it for DC. I'm, I'm hoping for the best. I hope for the best, and I hope Justice League and Wonder Woman is awesome. Suicide Squad, I hope is good too, but I don't have as much faith for it as I want to have with the others. But anyway, let's move on to Marvel. Um, Marvel has recently confirmed, a uh, week later after they confirmed uh, the Black Panther cast, we have our cast for Thor Ragnarok, which is the third Thor film. And basically it's going to take place right after Age of Ultron and answer the question of where were Thor and Hulk during um, Civil War? Well, apparently they had other shit to do. But anyway... Um, obviously for returning cast members, we have, obviously we have Chris Hemsworth as Thor, we have Tom Hiddleston as Loki, we have Mark Ruffalo, who is the Hulk, and Bruce Banner, we have, um, uh, Idris Elba, who I actually didn't think would come back after the shit he said about Marvel, but, um, I guess it's good that he's back, because Idris Elba's awesome, and we also have uh, Anthony Hopkins coming back, which I didn't think he would be back either. But I guess this lays to rest the theory of um, Loki killed Odin. But anyway, that's the old cast. In terms of the new cast, we have Kate Blanchett, who is an incredible actress. This news has been confirmed for a while, but it's reported that she'll be playing the villain Hela, who is... I think the first female villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is awesome. I'm all I'm all for that. We have Jeff Goldblum, who will be the Grandmaster. I actually don't know what that character is. I'm not as again. I don't read that many comics, and Thor is one of the like realms of comics, no pun intended, that I'm not too familiar with. Then we have Tessa Thompson, who was in Creed, which is amazing, who will be playing the hero Valkyrie. And then lastly, we have Carl Urban, who was Bones in the Star Trek trilogy, and who was Judge Dredd in Dredd, and he will be playing Scourge. This is a really awesome cast. Like, I am down for it all the way. Although, no Enchantress, but I'm all for this cast. It looks um, awesome. Out of all the Phase 3 movies, I will say that Thor Ragnarok is probably my least anticipated, and the reason I'm saying this is because Thor The Dark World for me was pretty underwhelming. While I liked it, and it was a little better when I saw it the second time, it's still a really missed opportunity and Marvel's weakest film. But it seems like with this stellar cast, maybe they're really going to put some more effort into this movie. And one thing that I like is that Natalie Portman's not coming back, because as great of an actress as she is, Jane Foster really didn't have much to do. Most of the time, 
she was just there to be Thor's love interest. She didn't really amount to much. She didn't contribute to anything. And really, I always thought Thor was better off with some other god or goddess like Sif or maybe in this movie Valkyrie, which I gotta say, poor Lady Sif, she never gets a break. Huh? So, yeah, that's for Thor Ragnarok. Now let's move on to another bit of casting news. I think this is confirmed. Uh, for Spider-Man Homecoming, which is Marvel's first Spider-Man movie under their control, even though it's being distributed by Sony, Marvel will have the final say on what this movie will be. And if you're wondering, that story about the Thor Ragnarok cast came straight from Marvel.com. Huh? And this story comes from Deadline. Huh? For a while, Michael Keaton was in talks to be in Spider-Man Homecoming as a villain, huh? and then he dropped out. Well, now he's back in, huh? and I think he's confirmed to be in it. Huh? Um, it says here, quote, Michael Keaton, who in April was in early talks for a villainous role in the Sony Marvel collaboration slash reboot Spider-Man Homecoming before falling out, is back in the mix again, and we've been told that his deal is closed. He apparently is set to play the iconic Spider-Man villain, the Vulture, and joins newly minted Spider-Man Tom Holland, along with Marissa Tomei, who plays Aunt May, and Robert Downey Jr., who plays Tony Stark slash Iron Man. This is a really good cast again. Michael Keaton as the Vulture, I don't know that much about the character, but on this site, they have a comic book cover um, of an old Spider-Man comic that has the Vulture, and Michael Keaton very much looks like uh, the cover. Maybe a little younger, but still. And Marvel has yet to really make bad casting decisions. Like, every one they've cast for their heroes and villains... Okay, for the villains, it's debatable because the villains have been a weak spot. But for their heroes, they've done, like, dead-on casting. And with Phase 3, even though Civil War is the only Phase 3 movie we have so far... It had one of their best villains ever, and I think if they continue to go this route, especially with Kate Blanchett as a villain in Thor The Dark World, Thor Ragnarok, I mean, sorry, it this is going to be epic. Like, this could possibly be the best phase that Marvel has, because they have Michael Keaton as a villain, they have Kate Blanchett as a villain, they have Josh Brolin, who's finally going to do things as, um, as what's his name, uh, Thanos, Thanos, huh? So... I'm excited for this, and it is really funny, I find it really ironic here, that um, Michael Keaton, who was once Batman, is now coming over to Marvel, and then J.K. Simmons, who played J. Jonah Jameson in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, is now heading over to DC to play Commissioner Gordon, so that's really interesting to say, so yeah, I'm excited for this cast, for both Spider-Man Homecoming and Thor Ragnarok. Watch, there's going to be a story for next week that, oh, no, Michael Keaton dropped out again. I'm like, damn it! I was excited. I mean, I'm still excited for Spider-Man Homecoming after uh, what we saw of him in Civil War. Which, by the way, I will be doing a Civil War spoiler review. I just, between my jobs, I haven't had the time to go see Civil War again. But this week, I'll be able to see it. And you know what? Since I reviewed X-Men early, uh, the same weekend, or Monday after... The weekend Civil War came out. I'll review. I'll do my spoiler review for Civil War this coming weekend when all the other reviews for X Men come out. But let's anyway. Let's move on from comic books to Star Wars. Uh, earlier this week, um, images have popped up from what is called the official visual story guide to Rogue One: A Star Wars Story. Uh, we have um, our first look at the entire Rogue One crew which includes a couple of aliens. I won't say uh, the names of these characters, but I will get say that I love how these Star Wars movies, these new Star Wars movies, are adding so much diversity to their cast members. Like, not just in, um, like, people of different races, but um, the fact that a woman's the leader of this group, the fact that we have a droid and two aliens on board, I think it's awesome. Like, this is going to be hopefully a really awesome movie and then uh for the empire side we have a look at our main villain um which he's in that pose that we saw in the um trailer but we also get um another look at a new imperial tank 
which I'm bummed they didn't use the tanks from the uh, Battlefront games, but whatever. And then our look at the Death Troopers, which look pretty menacing. Basically, they're black stormtroopers, and they look awesome. And there also is a photo of Darth Vader, which, I mean, we all knew Vader was going to be in this movie at some point. Hopefully not for too long, um, but... I mean, it would be very weird if they never mentioned or even showed Darth Vader at some point. Because if the movie is about uh, this band of rebels stealing the plans for the Death Star, it would be very weird that Darth Vader is not on this shit. But also, we have a couple of new starfighters. Uh, one, we have a new TIE fighter, which is called the TIE Striker. Which basically, if you took the wings of the TIE Interceptor, and instead of little blasters or whatever's in the middle, you put a TIE Fighter cockpit, huh? that's the TIE Striker, which may be a little simple in terms of how it looks, but it looks like it could be a very menacing ship. Huh? And then we also have a new rebel ship called the U-Wing, huh? which it looks kind of cool, I gotta say. I mean, but these ships, I gotta see them in action to really determine how cool they are. Huh? You could have that impression like, wow, this ship looks like a piece of junk. Huh? And then you see what it can do and you're like, okay, I take that back. Huh? Just like uh, Rey and Finn in The Force Awakens, they saw the Millennium Falcon as garbage. But then when they saw what it could do, it was badass. So, yeah, Rogue One's coming out. Um, I'm really looking forward to this movie. I'm a little nervous. There's parts of me that are nervous, but... I'm always nervous for a new Star Wars movie because I, the prequels just hurt everyone so bad. And given that this is the first spin-off movie, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Huh? I'm hoping for the best. Huh? Um, it could be the most different Star Wars movie because um, it's a war movie. It's a war movie and it won't have any Jedi. It won't have the fantasy element that the original trilogy and The Force Awakens had. But hopefully it'll be as awesome as those movies and not a bore fest the way the prequels were. So that does it for Star Wars. Um, let's talk trailers. Huh? Let's move over from Star Wars to Star Trek. Because in one week we get two Star Trek related trailers. Um, we finally got a new trailer for Star Trek Beyond. Which is the follow up to Into Darkness being directed by Justin Lynn, who directed um, uh, the Fast and the Furious movies. I, I wasn't blanking out on the Fast and the Furious movies. I was blanking out on another movie he did. I think it was Better Luck Tomorrow. Uh, it was a movie I really liked. Uh, and um, for a while, Star Trek Beyond was off everyone's radar. Like, everyone just kind of forgot it was coming out because the first trailer they put out was awful. Uh, like, it really looked like they were trying to turn Star Trek into Fast and Furious. Huh? And it's like, no, we don't want this. Now, granted, there's some people that have said, well, you've already ruined Star Trek with the first two movies in this series. And really, I mean, I'm not going to go into that. But bottom line, that first trailer looked awful. Then the second trailer came out. Huh? And I was like, wow, this trailer actually looks really good. Huh? Um. I'm starting to see more things. It's not trying to appeal to the Fast and the Furious crowd. And it got the movie back on my radar. So I'm looking forward to this. I mean, okay, I've already reviewed the Star Trek movies. Um, the first, in this new series, I gotta say. I love the first Star Trek that J.J. Abrams made. Um, it was the one that made me a fan. Huh? Because for a while, I was never into Star Trek. I was mo always more of a Star Wars guy. And granted, I'm still more of a Star Wars guy than Star Trek. Huh? But when I saw that first J.J. Abrams movie, I was like, wow, this this is awesome. Huh? And then I started seeing some of the older, older movies, watched a few episodes of the original series and Next Generation, and I became a fan. Not a hardcore fan, but I very much was a casual fan. Star Trek Into Darkness, I like the first half of it, but by the time it got to the second half... It just lost its steam. It got a little too convoluted. And the ending, I actually thought was crap. I mean, I still own Star Trek Into Darkness. And that's because the Blu-ray I have is like a double feature of that and the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, which I didn't own on Blu-ray already. And I will still say that Star Trek Into Darkness is not the worst movie 
uh, of the series at all. That that honor goes to uh, Star Trek V, Insurrection, and Nemesis. Yeah. Um, but I could definitely see that Star Trek Into Darkness was very disappointing. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why nobody was super thrilled about Star Trek Beyond. But I'm glad this new trailer came out because it's got me excited again. What also has me excited is the... Basically, it was an announcement trailer for the brand new Star Trek TV show, which I'm more excited about than Star Trek Beyond because it'll be the first Star Trek TV show to come out since I became a fan. And I just really want to see what they can do because, um, I mean, I really want to get much more into Star Trek. And, yep. Yeah, I mean, that's all I'd say about the trailers there. Let's get into another trailer that um, I think many people kind of put aside. But I'm going to remind people that we got a trailer for a Rocky Horror Picture Show remake. That's going to Fox. It's not a theatrical film. It's more of a Fox miniseries or, or TV movie. It was a little weird, but basically here's my problem with it. Rocky Horror Picture Show is a movie that you just can't go and remake directly. It had a charm to it that only could have been captured once. And I reviewed Rocky Horror Picture Show, and if you try watching that thing without a crowd, it's not going to come off very good. I mean, I really like Rocky Horror Picture Show myself, but the only way to really appreciate the movie is seeing it at the midnight screenings with everyone who's seen it over and over and over again and plus looking at this trailer it looks too clean rocky horror picture show had a certain like dirty look to it and it just this just looks too clean i i don't know um i'm not i'm not gonna see this not not out of protest but it's like i just don't have any interest in seeing it i don't even have much of an interest to see the original rocky horror picture show unless it's at the midnight screening so why would I even see... You get the point. I'm going around in circles. Maybe because I don't want to talk about this last trailer, which is the second trailer for Ghostbusters. The new Ghostbusters coming out in July. Which I've heard the internet talk about this thing non-stop. And it's gotten ugly at points. But let me say this about the trailer. It looks horrible. Like the first trailer... It looks awful. This one may be a little more tolerable than the first trailer, but I'm sorry. It just still looks like a bad movie. Okay, the charm of Ghostbusters was that, um, like, the comedy really came from the dynamic of all of its characters. Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, even Ernie Hudson. Like, those guys had such a great chemistry and worked off each other perfectly, and it was very well written. This new Ghostbusters here, I, I gotta say this. Uh, the idea of a female Ghostbusters is actually really cool. I'm down for that. But what I'm not down for is that the movie doesn't look funny at all. It looks like the humor that Paul Feig usually goes to when making these movies. Like a lot of pratfalls, slapstick, characters being loud and just silly all around. When that's not what Ghostbusters was about. It seems like everyone who's a, who has insulted this trailer, who said bad things about it, has been accused of being a sexist. And no, the trailer is not funny. Ghostbusters is supposed to be a comedy. Ghostbusters was one of the best comedies ever. It's my personal favorite comedy out there. And with this new Ghostbusters movie, it doesn't look like they capture the spirit of what that original one was. I mean, I'm hoping that this is just a trailer thing. Because I remember last year seeing trailers for Spy, the uh, movie that Paul Feig did with Melissa McCartney where she turned into a spy. And I remember that trailer being unwatchable. Like, it was awful. And then when I saw the movie, it was funny. I laughed a lot. And it ended up being one of my favorite comedies. I think it may even have been my favorite comedy of 2015. So, regardless, I'm hoping that this is just a trailer thing. I'm hoping this would be the first time ever where we get trailers that aren't funny, but then the movie ends up being hilarious, and it's like, 
okay, so you purposely showed us all the really bad jokes in the trailer and hid all the good shit in the movie. So th- that would be awesome. I'm, I'm hoping for that. I'm going to stay optimistic about this new Ghostbusters. But if this thing ends up being bad, then I'll be the first to say it. And I'm probably going to be really harsh on it because of my love of the original Ghostbusters. But let's move on to our final bit of news, which will segue into Blu-ray releases. Godzilla fans, rejoice. Rejoice that the return of Godzilla will officially be coming to DVD and Blu-ray in the United States for the first time ever. This is the 16th Godzilla film and the first in the second series of Godzilla films known as the Heisei era. And for a long time... It was one of the few Godzilla movies that never got an actual DVD release. For a long time, um, there were like four Godzilla movies that didn't get an actual DVD release. Uh, Godzilla Raids Again, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, The Return of Godzilla, and Godzilla vs. Biollante. Classic Media eventually released Godzilla Raids Again and Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster on DVD for the first time. And in 2012, I I forget what company it was. I think it was Mill Creek. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. They released Godzilla vs. Biollante on DVD and Blu-ray for the first time. And it's like, all right, well, there's only one Godzilla movie that remains. And the people that got it was Kraken Releasing, who released re-released Godzilla versus Hedorah, Godzilla vs. Gigant, and Ibero Horror of the Deep on DVD and on Blu-ray for the first time back in 2014, just to tie in with the release of Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. But now they've officially gotten the return of Godzilla, which was considered to be the rarest Godzilla movie in the United States. And this story right here comes from Sci-Fi Japan. This is a quote that they have from Kraken co-founder and managing director Matt Greenfield, who says, quote, I've been waiting for the rights to become available for a long time. I've been a huge Godzilla fan since I was a kid, and if I recall correctly, the first time I actually asked about this title was about 20 years ago when ADV Films was licensing Destroy All Monsters and Gunhead. Greenfield's previous label. Needless to say, the rights weren't clear at the time, and they still weren't clear when Kraken acquired Hedorah, Gigan, and Ibira. That was two years ago, huh? and since then, it's just been a waiting game, checking in with the folks at Toho every time I was in Tokyo until they finally gave the all clear. Huh? So this is going to be the very first time the this movie comes on DVD at all, but it'll also be the very first time that the original version, the Japanese version, comes to the United States. Because, like with Godzilla from 1954, this movie went through an Americanization, a heavy Americanization, where it was called Godzilla 1985, and basically they brought back Raymond Burr. Who, to play his character from the American version of the original movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Unfortunately, though, that version will not be featured. As Greenfield says, quote, That's a big part of why it's taken so long to announce this title. We tried, but unlike the classic media releases where the dubs were controlled by one company, the Godzilla 1985 situation is a mess. Between all the changes of ownership and title that have occurred after New World released their version, the fact that you're dealing with two entirely different production teams belonging to different sets of unions, and the fact that music from another film by a different composer was reused in New World's dub, there's a point where it became clear that it's just not going to happen. And it's not just that it would cost more than the title could probably make to try to clear all the issues, but that you'd be on pins and needles waiting for someone to pop up and make a claim over something you'd missed for years afterwards. So, I mean, it is a... Okay, here's my thing about Godzilla 1985. Um, It is a bummer that that version of the movie will not be released on DVD or Blu-ray. At the same time, I'm okay with that because... Godzilla 1985 
is a bad movie at all. It's a bad movie all around. It's a terrible Americanization of what is one of the best Godzilla movies out there. And one of the reasons, the main reason why it's such a bad movie, the American version, not the Japanese version, is because it completely alters a key element in the movie. I've reviewed The Return of Godzilla on my old channel, uh, but in the movie, it takes place during the Cold War. There's a scene when um, the Japanese establish that we're not going to allow the use of nuclear weapons against Godzilla because Japan has a no nuclear weapons policy uh, that the Americans and the Russians clearly don't have. Uh, excuse me. So th there's a scene when Godzilla appears at shore. Uh, he disables a ship, a Russian ship by accident, that has a launch button for a nuke that's aimed at Godzilla. The Russian commander tries to stop the launch, but he dies, and so the nuke gets launched by accident towards Godzilla. In the U.S. version, because of the Cold War going on, and the U.S. hated the Russians, they purposely changed it to where the Russian guy purposely launches the missile at Godzilla, and it's just insulting. And the reason is because this movie really tried to be like the original version, and to the extent that it followed Ishiro Honda's original themes of that first movie, where humanity came together in their worst possible time, and to make that change just to appeal to U.S. audiences was stupid. It was terrible. But, I mean, it would have been, it would, still would have been interesting to have this version on DVD. But I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Although it is interesting that this will be the first time, I think, ever, even for Japan, where Toho's international dub of The Return of Godzilla is being released on DVD and Blu ray. And I. Toho's dubs, uh, they manufacture cheap dubs for a lot of their movies, uh, for those who don't want to watch in Japanese. I can't watch those dubs anymore. Although, for, in this instance, I'll be very curious to see what the dub is like. It's probably going to be dreadful, but I don't know. This is super exciting news for me. I'm, I'm getting this thing day one because this really is one of my favorite Godzilla movies. So... That pretty much does it for all the news. Uh, last news story was about a DVD and Blu-ray release. Now let's get into the Blu-ray releases that are coming out this week. Um, on May 24th. Let me pull it up here. There we go. Okay, not much to say here. We have Manhunter from uh, Shout Factory. We have Tom Hanks, The Blurbs. No idea what that was. From the Criterion Collection, we have The Player. Uh, we also have The Finest Hours, which is a movie from Disney that came out this year, like in January, and bombed. It starred Chris Pine. And then we also had Zoolander 2, which I heard was awful, so dodged a bullet right there. We also have, um, from Kino, the Buster Keaton Shorts Collection, and that pretty much does it. It's around this point that the least interesting uh, Blu-ray releases come out. Uh, next week, there will be a few more interesting things. Maybe not for the better. But that's all that's coming out this week in terms of Blu-ray releases. And that pretty much does it for the show. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for sticking in. Um, I'm going to try something uh, for next week. Um, I want to have a little... Q&A session at the end of every episode. At the moment, I'm not doing these things live, but if you have a question that you'd like me to answer regarding movies, just leave it in the comments below, and I'll read them for next week's episode. And again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Give me more advice on what I should do. How can I continue to improve this show? Let me know in the comments below, along with your questions for next week. Like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends. Don't forget to check out my official website. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, and Rift.tv. Don't forget to check out uh, my pages on MoviePilot.com and Geek Down Nation. And until next time, this is the real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one. <laughs>